Hey everybody, welcome back to Let's Talk Bourbon for another special edition. I'm John. I'm James. And today we're sitting here with Chef Weeda Michael, the legend, the myth, <laughs> um, the chef that we all know and love here in Lexington. And if you haven't heard of Chef Weeda Michael, you should look her up right now. Uh, she uh, has eight restaurants, has been in the chef game since 1987. And, uh, Before seven, you were born, John. <laughs> actually, five years after. So I'm right there. But um, I was dreaming about our food around then. So, uh, And then also a seven-time James Beard nominee. Holy cow. Yeah. So we're so excited to chat with you today a little bit about uh, bourbon. And it's Bourbon Heritage Month, guys. So how about that? That's exciting. Yeah. So um, James and I just wanted to talk to you today a little bit and get to know more about your... Um, endeavors in bourbon and food because we know food's your specialty but you've also been very involved in bourbon yes for 10 years i was the chef in residence at woodford reserve distillery and uh this year with covid and all the changes that our business has been going through i did retire from woodford but i'm still one of their biggest fans so we're gonna uh, and in doing that role and playing that role as chef in residence i um i worked with chris morris and uh wonderful Learn. I tell people I know a lot about one bourbon, and now I'm, I'm interested to learn about a lot more about a lot of different bourbons. But Chris, when I first came down to Woodford, uh, helped me understand um, sort of the flavors of, at that time, they only had one bourbon, Distiller Select, with a flavor wheel. But it was a graphic flavor wheel, a written flavor wheel. And it was, uh, I was part of the Woodford Reserve Cookbook in 2004, um, and Woodford really started this whole in the early 2000s started bringing chefs all down to the distillery to eat food and drink their spirit at the same time because in that in those days it's hard to remember now but um honestly people didn't think you should eat anything with woodford or any other bourbon because the bourbon would kill the flavor of the food so in order to get my head around what bourbon and i was one of those people a big wine lover liked bourbon didn't love it definitely didn't want anybody drinking it with a meal that I had prepared. So it was a real education to go down and experiment. And this was the way we started our education, uh, was a plate similar to this. So I thought we could start there tonight. Yeah, That's no, that great. sounds great. And before we dive into this, I'm, I'm curious because you've been, um, in the local scene between food and bourbon, you know, what trends have you been seeing as far as, um, I guess culinary and bourbon riding side by side with each other over the years. I mean, have you seen a, a difference or has it gone more mainstream and cool now, I guess, with the bourbon boom or? I have maybe a long view. <laughs> but yeah, when I first came, I came back to Kentucky after chef school uh, and having lived in New York City in 1993. And at that time, nobody, there was no, you know, bourbon was in a, a, a hole, so to speak. Um, and then you saw, saw Maker, saw Woodford and started to develop these premium brands and premium whiskeys and bourbons in Kentucky. And then only, in, but still all the purists felt like, oh, you can't add anything but a little bit of water or an ice cube and you can't definitely mix with it and you cannot taste with it. So it was a long time. I think now seeing all of it come to the table, honestly, there's probably a little too much on the table. Um, so you have to be a more discerning um, consumer than you used to be. And part of developed connoisseurship, uh, part of developing connoisseurship is to develop your palate in this way and create what's called a palate memory. So I guess I've seen the gamut and now um, love to do bourbon menus, love to pair bourbon with every course, love to use bourbon in recipes. Uh, and I think of bourbon as sort of a finishing ingredient and also a foundational ingredient and in different bourbons bring different flavors to the table. Very cool. I know well, for the holidays, you two paired up together for a Christmas cookie pairing. Yeah. Which fun at Thirsty Fox. Yeah. yeah. And you do have some boxes still that you do here. Well, we, we started a, um, we're starting a bourbon club at Thirsty Fox. So this is, you know, a passion of mine. But also we started a bourbon cookie box, which is the, all of these cookie recipes came from this flavor wheel. Um, and so there's all different kinds of five different kinds of cookies and you can, they're all tasting notes and you can order those on weedamichael.com. What goes better with bourbon than cookies? <laughs> Not <now>? Nothing. <laughs> Honestly. Well, we'll find out what else came there in yeah. a minute. Well, I think we're excited to kind of get into your rubric and your methodology on this. We've seen a lot of different flavor wheels and sure. some concepts out there, but I think you, the culinary approach is really 
um, easy for people to kind of get into and understand, and especially when they're at home looking to pair things with bourbon, uh, this will be a good start, I guess. So yeah. you want to take us through? and Yeah, sure. Well, first let's set our oh, yeah. palette. And sure. just, this is Woodford Distiller Select. Cheers. 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 Welcome Cheers. to Holly Hill. Oh, yeah. That, that standard Woodford reminiscent nose. I have to say I'm a batched bourbon fan um, because when you get into single barrels, um, I, I think single barrels are fun, but when you're doing a flavor wheel, you have to do a different flavor wheel for every barrel. Yeah. So you have to kind of really investigate the barrel. What makes Woodford a great chef's bourbon, I think, is because it's got so much continuity, so much consistency. So you can really develop a lot of recipes and things around They there. mingle for consistency, so that yeah. does make it fun probably as a chef because you know you're getting a reliable product to pair with. Yeah, you know what your flavor your flavor profile is going to be. Right. So then you can develop your menu around that. I think it's neat because that's what they kind of do. They want to hit as much around the circle as possible. Yeah. In their urban. They're looking for balance. Highlighting one area. So it's a nice balance and great place to start. That's right. Well, so on the plate we have, this is an aged Kentucky cheese called Ted's. It's from Kenny Mattingly. It's a cow's milk cheese. So we're going to taste that. Then we have toasted hazelnuts, a fresh summer peach, a mandarin orange, section and then a mandarin orange peel dried cranberries local honey from just down the road at happy jacks a little dark chocolate and some sorghum from right here in woodford county oh, so wow. we um we have double oaked on the left and distiller select on the right so of course the the distiller selects flavor wheel it's just as james said it's it's five equal pieces but the flavor wheel or the flavor profile on a on a double oaked is half sweet aromatic so it's very very sweet it's a dessert a dessert finishing bourbon, but sure. feel free. We'll kind of taste through all what of it. What do you them. recommend we serve? We start with the cheese. Awesome. Okay. And you just are going to chew a little. And this is a distiller select for sure. Isn't that good? It cuts through the creaminess and adds some spice. Yep. Yeah, it adds. I think it adds creaminess. It takes away from that um, um, alcohol vapors, like kind of morph into kind of a creamy, plus a little bit of the, the spice is more pronounced, right? Well, and also, the it's nice to start with cheese. Cheese is not on the flavor wheel for Woodford Reserve, by the way. It's just a, a great way of showing the pear. It's, it's a contrast to the bourbon, right? So it's lactic acid, it's aged, it's salty. Um, it does need the spice of the bourbon. And it also makes you salivate. And then that sal the, all your saliva washes the bourbon through the palate. But it, it allows the palate to accommodate the bourbon. So it's a nice way to start with bourbon. When you're pairing, when you're starting a big dinner, a nice thing to do is do a little bit of a cheese tasting with bourbon. Because it allows, yeah. it just brings the palate together a little bit better. And then the hazelnut, you've got two. You can try one with the distillers and then maybe one with the double oak. And these are toasted hazelnuts. That's really important. Oh, wow. That's very different from the first pairing. Now that, you, you might get peanut, peanut butter. Mm -hmm. All the nut oils. The alcohol is taking the nut oil straight up the front of the palate. And sometimes it's so intense, I feel like it tastes like artificial hazelnut syrup. But the only thing is, is this one little nut. But, but to say that the bourbon kills the flavor of that nut is crazy, right? It really just it. takes it and blows mm -hmm. it apart. So it's a wonderful. I have to say, I'm being with the double oak on that person. Yeah, yeah, I might have to try that. <laughs> Ten supplies the char flavor in that. Oh yeah, and the nut. You got to think about nuts as representing the barrel, the wood notes, but I mean, you get so much creaminess. Now, like the phenolic compounds, like in the double oaks, like in that tasting, it's interesting because it almost dull, like dials down the sweetness, but enhances more of the, the oak and the, mm -hmm. and the wood sort of accent to it so that that's very interesting and that's a that's a neat thing so when you when you do stuff like this 
do you purposefully think about, you know, what maybe to, because we're comparing two right now, so right. Like, do you look for a difference? Do you try to kind of stay, or do you just, is that the fun of playing with it, I guess, when you're... Well, we, there are specific flavor wheels built for um, double oaked and built for the rye. Almonds, marzipan, those things are going to accentuate, those nuts accentuate the sweetness of the double oaked. Um, whereas the hazelnut and the sort of that hazelnut oil, and same same thing with the pecan, for the double oaked brings out the barrel. And oh, okay. sometimes that's really nice, especially if you're thinking about a beginning, you want to have an open, open a cocktail um, on a multi-course bourbon dinner. And now I've worked with a lot of Woodford Reserve on these multi-course dinners. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, maybe I want to have fresh apple cider, double oaked, which is beautiful with apples. And I might put toasted hazelnuts or toasted pecans or something like that in like a nut crusted cheese or something like that. And it really, that's when you get, that's when you can begin to start really thinking about how things pair together. And you're pairing for the finish too. Not oh yeah. Pair. Yeah. Okay, now we have fresh peach. So it's going to go great with either one. I love peaches soaked in bourbon. I love, I love peach with, uh, mm. oh wow, bourbon cocktails in general in the summer, mm -hmm. where a lot of people steer towards mint or maybe the traditional lime or just other citrus. I like peach and bourbon as like a refreshing mm -hmm. summer cocktail. It's like my favorite. How much do you play with infusion? Oh my god, that with the double oaked. It's fire. It's so good. I shouldn't say that. That's really good. Well, I used to do a lot of infusing because when I first started, this was a bourbon trend I lived through. When I first started with Woodford, there were all these giant Woodford bottles they were giving everybody with a little spigot on the bottom for their infusion bottles. And this was sort of in the vodka infused vodka craze. Remember how you you go to a bar and it'd have like 10 different absolutes or whatever, 10 different flavored right. vodkas. So bourbon, at first, but just to try to get people interested in going with bourbon, I think people were, some of the distilleries were playing with that. Um, I still do a lot of infusing with, uh, so especially dried fruits, raisins, craisins, apricots, vanilla bean. Um, one of my favorite infusions at Derby is to is with Old Forester and to pour out the old bourbon, save it, pack the bottle full of mint, pour the Old Forester back in over the mint, and then lay that bourbon down for a year, and then drink it for your mint julep the next Derby. Wow. It's really, really good. Yeah. Especially after a year. Yeah. All right, so now let's try the orange. Now this is, I'll be interested to, to hear what you guys have to say. Um, this is two part with the orange. Just the... I, I really can't taste the alcohol at all. Um, I get like honey, definitely. And it's just kind of like a sweet, almost like a sweet honeysuckle vibe. But that is so like mouthwatering and juicy. I think it just kind of like, I, where, where the alcohol go kind of thing, but it's pretty pleasant. Yeah. Like a pleasant oil. Almost. Yeah. yeah. And it dissipates pretty, you know, now the finish is picking it up. Um, so one of the most fun parts about an orange tasting, and usually I don't have the mandarin orange, um, is to take this part of the orange and express as much of the oil as you can on the on your tongue. And I also encourage people to just rub their teeth with it. <laughs> it's That's not exactly awesome. elegant, but... <laughs> but you want to really... It'll help, un pe it'll help folks understand the citrus notes. Because you don't think citrus notes when you think bourbon, but oh they're my certainly gosh. there. They're there. Oh, so this was... is one case where you're allowed to play with your food, especially with the orange peel. But yeah, that citrus. And wow. it, it doesn't and have as much. It doesn't juice. have as much as. You got to kind of really squeeze it, because it's not like a navel orange peel. Oh yeah, now I'm getting. It. That's interesting. That's really substantially different than the navel orange, which is what I usually have. Um, it but, comes off a little peppery, but it's but it's very again pleasant, and I think on the finish. I up think front, it's all sweet. The, is this similar to the concept of uh, when you're making dishes with like citrus like this, where if you add in the zest, it just adds like an explosion of additional enhancement almost to what well, you're doing. I or? think a lot of people are don't understand the significance of like a twist in a cocktail. So if you 
are going to put make an old-fashioned and you're going to have that orange zest and that orange oil it's very important to float that across the top of the bourbon now this mandarin orange zest may not be what you want to use as a bartender but if you have that nice orange zest you're going to twist that right across the top and that's very important to the changes the whole character of the drink it makes the bourbon gives it a brandy finish mm -hmm. it uh it's it's a dusty orange flavor coming right across the bottom of your nose right across the top of uh in between your nose and your upper lip, I always think of. And so uh, it can also give notes of grapefruit, lemon, lime. It depends, it changes each time, which is something that I really like too. And I think citrus is one of the very best pairs with, you know, that's the original whiskey sour. Right. right. That's the original old fashioned. That's how you get at that. I think a lot of people forget that it was lemon long before it was orange. Oh yeah. You know. Absolutely. Um, okay, then these are craisins and um, I'm just going to chew and either bourbon, either, either side works really well with it. Mm. Hey, I've never tried cranberries and bourbon, so that's new. Well, for me, what happens is the bourbon rehydrates the fruit mm -hmm. on the center of the palate. It's like a big cherry bomb, and you can feel that little tiny craisin just growing and growing until you feel like you have this big plump cherry just sitting on the front of your tongue. Mm -hmm. You're not really getting a lot of the bourbon, which is part of how, part of the myth that we're trying to explode, which is that you can't drink bourbon and eat food at the same time and taste the food. That's just not true. So you really get the cherry and the raspberry and all those mm -hmm. characteristics out of the cranberry that you... And as you drink through that, now your palate is set for that red berry flavor. Now, if you take another sip, you're going to really get it out of the bourbon. You taste that double oaked. It's all cherry and berry at this point right now. And I'm, I'm also getting some uh, very much, like I wouldn't normally get it in Woodford, but I guess with this with this particular pairing, like I get the first time I think I've ever said it about Woodford, like kind of some floral qualities, mm -hmm. components coming through. Yeah where traditionally the spice and that floral aspect is like really like below, you know, yeah. more of a tertiary kind of thing, but it's very yeah. pork run, I think almost. Yeah. And that's part of what you're using the flavor wheel for is to build palate memory. So when you're saying to yourself, you can get at those flavors by either echoing back to the palate, what you want to find in the bourbon. So, you know, everybody wants toasted nut, sorghum, sweet finishes, warm spices, on the palate when they're making a fine bourbon. And the normal consumer needs to be able to locate those flavors in their mind with the bourbon physically in order to be able to find them when they're drinking the bourbon without those flavors. So it's just a way of echoing back or you can do it through contrast too. Oh yeah, because I see a, a huge difference in that one too because this one's more floral, but this one was more that dark kind dark, of cherry. Dark red fruit, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now this is our local honey. And I know honey bourbon is a thing, but I, I thought it'd be fun for you guys to try the honey and the sorghum. I just take a little bit of each and mix them together and call it a day. That's really good. What are you, what are you getting out of that? That is so different than, um, before we comment, can we do the sorghum? Sure. sure. I love the acidity of that sorghum. Yeah, that kind of manifest like the sorghum by itself, I was like, it's kind of intense, but then when you mix it with a bourbon, it, it turned into like almost a, a milky way. Yeah, yeah, it creams it out. It's total nougat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to eat those two so close together. Normally, I don't do honey on a flavor wheel. This is the first time I don't like, but I feel like um, all the grass that this these, these ate on, to me, it just came singing through. Um and I get a pepper. I've got a very peppery finish going on right now. But 
But I think the thing that surprises people is time after time they'll say, oh, I, I don't like molasses or I don't like sorghum. And then um, they, they try this with the spirit and it just pulls that creaminess, that creamy, oh, yeah. creamy caramel finish way, way out in a way that the honey doesn't because the honey's grassy, it's super sweet, and so it has a whole different With the honey and the double oak, the, I get a little bit of spearmint. Yes. Bring it up the rye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that food and whiskey pairing is in more sense because there aren't a lot of flavors out there. It's alcohol soluble anyway. Yes. So it would be yeah. drawing out more of those flavors to higher fruits versus. And maple syrup's another great one too. If you're going to taste with nat with sweeteners, taste with natural ones. Um, and we've I've done a lot of maple maple syrup and bourbon in the past. We're getting on that time of year. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, the last thing is the little, this is a 65% uh, chocolate, so it's semi-dark. And I think most people have had bourbon and chocolate. Natural pairing. <laughs> it's our bourbon, you know, it's our bourbon ball. I always, yeah, I always find it to be very complimentary, like the, like the caramel and the vanilla. It's, it's kind of a further enhanced, and you're right, it's like making a, your own bourbon ball just in the pairing. Well, and um, most people are surprised that the, the flavor they really get is the vanilla yeah. from the chocolate. Mm -hmm. It's fun. We've done a lot of really complicated um, flavor wheel pairings in the past based on the work of a guy named Francois Chartier, who um, was the uh, sommelier for El Bouy, which was a very famous restaurant in Spain. And Francois decided that he would pair all the wines. Um, it was like a 17 course tasting menu and we pair these wines based on the molecular commonalities of the food and the wine rather than on geography because a lot of times with wine you pair for geography so in other words in french wine it's burgundy it's bordeaux it's bordeaux all based on geographical regions Eat where it's made. right well, yeah so but, i was going to ask about that because in wine it's really big for what grows together goes together mm -hmm. but What's your take on that for bourbon? You know, do you think that traditional Kentucky dishes pair better with bourbon than some of the other ones out there? Or I guess what's your philosophy? One of the things that was interesting about Francois's work is like, you can take a very ripe piece of pineapple and a roasted strawberry and you blindfold somebody and they're molecular twins on your palate. So you can build off these molecular twins um, if you remove one of the senses, especially the sense of sight, um, and it can completely change the way you taste the bourbon. And it's really fascinating. If you want, I mean, Chris, all Chris Morris for years would say, oh, there's so much banana character in this wood I'm like, you are so crazy. I have never tasted banana in this, in, in all the years. So then we, we were teaching this class based on Francois' work, which nobody really understood but me and Chris, but we had so much fun doing it. Um, <laughs> And I took a really, really ripe pineapple that I that I ripened for probably almost two weeks, and then I macerated it in Distiller Select for about three or four days, and then we ate the pineapple, and it was all banana, 100% wow. banana. You did not even taste pineapple, and you didn't taste bourbon. You just tasted banana. So it was really fascinating. And then there's a there's a molecular twin with roasted fenugreek, and um, and the, car and the caramel notes that you get in, in charring the barrel and developing all those vanillins and then all the caramel notes. And so that roasted fenugreek we then took and made into a kind of a maple roasted fenugreek popcorn. Um, so you can really oh, have yeah. a lot of fun. That and that's how you engage the chef's imagination. And it all has to work through these palate memories that you're creating and some research. But... Uh, Taking it beyond this is really fun to do too. This is a great way to, at home, just sit down with your favorite bourbon, whatever it may be, and a group of different tastes. And you both have so much science behind your tasting. I don't. I basically am just tasting for the flavors that I taste. I'm just trying to identify what's on my palate and what I think would be delicious with it. I just am sheer pairing for deliciousness. That's it. Delicious. Yeah, I could have kind of do that for a living. <laughs> Versus us, we don't try to create dishes for a living. <laughs> tend to be delicious. Right. We might 
create a flight or create the spirit itself. But yeah, I think, uh, no, it's very interesting. And you know, there, there's this whole concept right now of how the bourbon industry is continuing to grow um, in a multitude of directions. But I think the, the, the big term we hear a lot about, Chef, is uh, napification of bourbon and what the experience is going to look like. Do you see in our near future more culinary sort of, you know, experiences at the distilleries and yeah. more, you know, do you think that's what's coming? Were we or? leading that way before COVID? Yes. We yeah, were. see, we're... Yeah, for sure. I think we were. And it'll come back. It'll return. Um, I mean, I'm really proud of the pioneers we have in our distilling industry in Kentucky and how they, you know, how Owsley Brown opened the doors to Woodford Reserve and built that, built LeBro and Graham, then Woodford Reserve as a place to welcome people. Same as Maker's Mark with the Samuels family and how hospitable they've been. I think they're sort of a hallmark for how we welcome people. And you look at Willett, they have a new restaurant, they have a new bar. So yes, the napification, but I think we might do it better. You know, <laughs> I think we might, we might have uh, just a little bit more beautiful rural community. Um, and Southern should, hospitality. And Southern right? hospitality. But we have just an amazing, the thing I love about the distilling industry in Kentucky is that it's located in rural Kentucky primarily. And I hope that it doesn't relocate into these urban centers because I feel like when you're driving down to Woodford or you're driving down to Castle and Key or you're driving down to Makers or you're driving to Willett and you're getting to Bardstown, you're really seeing a part of Kentucky as a global tourist possibly or somebody from California or New York that you might not normally see if you just fly into one of the major metropolitan areas and take off. So that's one of the reasons I always put Snorgum on the flavor wheel. I, I know that they'll put whatever they can in a bourbon bottle to sell it, like honey bourbon. I know they're never going to do that with sorghum. Right. <laughs> You're going to have to come here to taste that sorghum. Well, and that's, right. that's what we want. That's what we want to see. Well, Chef, uh, you know, we really appreciate a lot of the insights here. And I think uh, the only other question that I have, and James, feel free to step in, is uh, what, what's next for you and your endeavors? We, we've got the Thirsty Fox Bourbon Club, and yeah. I get the privilege of helping you with that. And, yeah. you know, anything else coming come along for the restaurants or... Well, right now all the restaurants are open. Holly Hill's getting it's ready exciting. to open on the inside uh, in, in another week and a half. Um, we have our bourbon cookie box that we're marketing for Bourbon Heritage Month. Um, and we have a cookbook that we'll be releasing on the, uh, the cover. is just confirmed and done, so we'll be marketing it in the coming weeks. And it will be released on... April 27th of 2021. So. And where can they go to do that? Just Amazon or on your website? Readamichael.com. It'll be available for sale and we'll ship it. Awesome. Wonderful. Uh, favorite go-to cocktail? My favorite go-to cocktail is the Manhattan. I'm a 100% Manhattan girl. My husband's from New York. What am I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure yeah. to have you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're excited to have you. education. Absolutely. Well, guys, thanks so much for uh, tuning in. I know uh, we're going to try to get this out to more channels this time for a special edition with Chef Weeda Michael taking some uh, definitely busy time out of her day to spend with us. And we're very appreciative of that. But uh, feel free to, again, uh, if you liked what you saw today, like and subscribe above. We really appreciate that. Follow us along. Um, and uh, as always, drink more bourbon. Thanks for watching. Careful. Yes, yeah, stay safe. <laughs>